The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to History of Jackson. Now before we jump into the episode, I'd like to ask you to consider supporting History of Jackson and myself through the Buy Me A Coffee link in the description below or through History of Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts. Now the reason why I'm being quick is we have a very long special episode today with Dr. Christopher Harrison speaking about a brand new concept called genocidal conscription. Now without further ado, because this is a long episode, I won't steal too much of your time and enjoy listening to Dr. Christopher Harrison. So hello and welcome back to the History with Jackson podcast. Today we're talking to author and historian Dr. Christopher Harrison all about his brand new book, Genocidal Conscription, Drafting Victims and Perpetrators Under the Guise of War. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing very well, Jackson. How about yourself? No, I'm doing very I'm very well. I'm very, very excited to talk about your book and the topics that you discuss in your book because I think it's a it's a very important area of discussion and I think that we're going to give a lot of food for thought for people to have. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, thank you very much for having me on the podcast. I'm uh, very excited as well to be getting this work out to people that are interested in such topics. The first question I want to ask you, and I ask this to, to all our guests, is what was the inspiration for this work? Well, I'll, I'll try to give you the shorter version of that answer. Uh, the longer one is very much a, a personal biography of sorts. Um, but essentially, my earliest memory of anything to do with warfare was uh, a very uh, personal family memory that my dad had. I was probably seven years old or so, and it was a pretty formative memory for myself as well, looking back, because uh, although the book is genocidal conscription, looking at these genocidal regimes, there's a puzzle in my family's uh, remembrance of World War One in particular, uh, due to an ancestor who fell on the first day of the infantry advance of the Battle of the Somme, July 1st, 1916. And so my dad never met him, but when he would uh, see the, the laying of the reef or various memorial uh, activities, remembrance services, he Variably, depending on the, the time and how he felt, the, the memory I recall the first time he mentioned it, he, he broke into tears. And he wasn't the kind of guy that would often do that. Let's put it that way. Uh, big burly uh, dude who was, you know, kind of brought up uh, in the wake of World War II in London and the back streets, kind of made it himself in his own path through life so you you just it didn't really fit why would why would he suddenly burst into tears about someone he didn't even meet um and so it was because of this gap that exists still i would argue in british history and the retelling of some of these more famous events in military history where there's a huge disconnect between the personal the familial retelling and memory and then the official histories so all the way through my formative years and while I live in the U.S. now and work here in Arizona, I was brought up in Britain and Ireland. So I went through many schools uh, in the British system where it was very sterile, very um, impersonal and uh, a huge disconnect. It became abstract in terms of what happened, never mind why it happened, uh, in terms of this uh, acceptance and this expectation of mass losses. Um, so uh, at the same time, on my other side, my family, from my mom's side, uh, Irish, Catholic, somewhat Republican nationalists. So you got this war hero, Church of England type family on one side uh, and the ancestors of versus the troubles of Ireland and the disputes of who gets to run the country, who gets to tell the history. So I was getting all sorts of different uh explanations of historical events some of which wasn't even in the school system i don't make yourself but when i went through it no one talked about the irish republican movement and nationalism and the the easter rising of 1916 it was not even in the books never mind talked about by the teachers um so i was actually all the way until i got to study for college as an undergrad here in america that i started to learn much more about the british empire and also uh how it was that 
such mass losses became normalized in World War I because maybe it's still contentious. Maybe it's, uh, again, this kind of abstract officialdom telling of history that really just left too many puzzles, too many questions left unanswered for myself. So I wanted to get into that and through my uh, first MA studies and then PhD, I was uh, drawn to this issue of how it could be the case that a genocidal regime would throw bodies into the mix, not in some effort of holding a line or a pursuit of victory, but specifically to expend unwanted peoples, unwanted groups of a population. And so that's the, the origins of the project. I find it quite fascinating, really, how you're able to tie together your your familiar experience and bring that into your, your career and your research. Uh, I think it's you know it's it's definitely something that I've seen a lot of historians kind of try and combine as something they experienced growing up or their family experience and trying to explore that in more detail. Uh, and having having st- sat on either side of a teacher's desk as a student and teacher, I certainly agree with that assessment of the British British education system where we tend to get too focused on certain big events and be very sterile about them. So I think I think that's that's a that's a great assessment of some of the issues that we have with exploring these events in our system. But you know the book that we're looking at is is about genocidal conscription and I certainly hadn't come across the term before and I'm 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 certain quite a few of our listeners might not have come across it. So what does the term actually mean and what what are its origins? Well, I, I combine uh this Crime in international law, uh, it's a more recent development in terms of uh, criminal concepts, the word genocide, and I'll get to that in a little bit, with conscription, the required service that states insist their civilians complete. Uh, and so the combination of the two, genocide or conscription, it's talking about the intentional destruction of a group by which a state applies conscription and its levers of power uh, to not just mobilize, but intentionally destroy those recruits through warfare. Uh, So when we look at this term genocide, it comes from a jurist and also a scholar, Raphael Lemkin, 1944, in uh, the Axis occupied Europe work that he completed during World War II. And he comes up with this term genocide to explain uh, the destruction of a tribe or a group. And it is the first uh, penning of the word. It's the first detailed explanation of the word. And since then, four or so years later, the United Nations put together its definition because Lemkin was putting it together in a report to talk about mass atrocities that later became this term we know of the Shoah and the Holocaust. But at the time, those terms weren't in use. And so uh, 1948, a few years later, the UN, through a lot of his work, his advocacy and others that attempted to identify this unacknowledged uh, crime that takes place often in war, but not always, genocide, the UN uh, termed the criminal application of the word, which is different from Lemkin's original term. And the UN came up with five particular acts. The first one, most people are more familiar with, killing members of the group. But there are also four other forms, outcomes of genocide, which we can get into to some extent. Uh, And so with those uh, terminologies, those definitions, I uh, go back and forth in the book. I look at what happens in terms of the cases I study and the applications we can consider in terms of uh, assessing and identifying concerns for contemporary cases and nations uh, in the context of the United Nations definition of the crime of genocide. But at the same time, I still think that there's also a lot to learn from Lemkin's work because I would argue there's a few elements that have not necessarily been um, as thoroughly explored that we might want to uh, take a, another look at. And the reasons why is often the United Nations is this uh, attempt to prosecute and punish. But Lemkin's work is more so to do with this idea of prevention, of actually identifying what's going on in a number of different cases. And then you can pick out moments at which there's a chance to maybe prevent 
switch out some policies, and hopefully in the future, we won't see the repetition of such events. It's it's interesting to see the difference between those two definitions. Uh, certainly one that arises through you know individual studying and then through the needs of an international organisation. So how different is conscription in genocidal and totalitarian regimes and how does it differ to conscription in more traditional regimes? Well, I would say that we have to think about what do we mean by traditional regimes. Um, totalitarian regimes, certainly exceptional in terms of politics in countries. Uh, big examples, we could think of uh, Soviet Union, think of uh, Nazi Germany, other Axis allies of Nazi Germany. You could talk about other cases of genocide, such as the Khmer Rouge and its attempt to construct a totalitarian regime. Uh, Soviet Union is the big one because it lasted much longer than the others uh, in terms of the, the cases and the evidence we can actually point to. Um, but So taking up this idea of what might be otherwise considered as traditional, well, you've got all sorts of other types of regimes, democratic regimes, republican structures of government, authoritarian, which is this uh, collection of different forms that are perhaps on the pathway towards totalitarian. Uh, maybe we'll just come up with a, a brief explanation of totalitarian. The idea that the state is attempting or has already secured total control over all facets of society. Um, uh, and so when you think of authoritarian, there's elective authoritarian, right? So there's some democratic processes that take place in certain regimes at some levels of power, whether it's local, it could be industrial in terms of who's running a factory floor as the supervisor or the manager. Uh, it might well be in terms of who's allocating the resources from the centralized state to the local provinces. Um, so authoritarian regimes are, are certainly something that we would want to look at as red flags towards perhaps totalitarian regimes. Uh, and then we've got empires as well as nation states looking back in time. Uh, so when the question comes to how has conscription been utilized, required service often for the military uh, being utilized by these different states and what might be the difference between totalitarian uses versus others. Uh, I, we, we could go back as long as recorded history to talk about the required and compelled service duties that states insist their civilians fulfill. So uh, for myself, uh, my focus is much more on the modern cases, especially this pivot point in World War I, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but how has conscription been used? Often it is uh, a viable and legitimate tool of national security to recruit, train, deploy uh, civilians who become some form of conscripted soldier. And often that's the case in some type of national crisis a security threat on its border. And so defensively, conscription is fairly accepted as a norm and a reliable, consistent way to mobilize the necessary forms of state-mandated and supported force. Soldiers, conscripts. Uh, you could go back all the way to the Roman Empire to figure out what this first initial uh, term conscription is used in in the historical records. Um, it's this idea of being enlisted for service in the military. Now, when we look at the uh, issue of how then might that be manipulated, taken advantage of by totalitarian regimes, well, often you're talking about uh, what Max Weber talked about about 100 years ago, the monopolization of force. This process where state is uh, recruiting, putting on the payroll, the officers who have a gun, who have some kind of arms and a badge, they're uh, authorized by the state to use certain aspects of force, whether that be policing or military. But a totalitarian regime is looking to conscript uh, its members of state institutions who are going to do the dirty work, who are going to go on the street and enforce the will of a totalitarian regime without any regard to civilian rights or civil liberties. And so the uh, difference between a totalitarian regime that conscripts and other regimes that conscript 
is that it isn't anything to do with defense against an enemy, whether it's in a civil war or across borders internationally, but more so about uh, physically enforcing the rule of the totalitarian state's will. And this could be through uh, punitive, uh, physical harm, executions, massacres, uh, the, the number of violations of human rights that we could get into uh, points out where the evidence comes from, where the historical documents uh, exist in terms of demonstrating and illustrating the manipulated or uh, somewhat subverted use of conscription as a tool uh, to enforce totalitarian, totalitarian rule. In my book, I go a little step further to not just talk about totalitarian regimes or uh, the potential uses of conscription in these compromised ways, but also as a tool of genocide itself. So I'd, I'd like to, I'd really like to unpack that last point. Then, how are they able to commit the or use this as a tool to commit genocide itself? Uh, you know, one of the arguments that you mentioned in your book is that a regime can commit war and genocide at the same time through their conscripts. So, how is that possible? Looking at the issues of who the enemy is really helps to distinguish the difference between uh, a state that's at war in some kind of conflict with a declared enemy. Uh, you could talk about civil wars internally within the border of the state. You could talk about international wars. And I look at World War One and World War Two in my cases, uh, and the, the issue of a declared enemy of a foreign territory is as we all know, when it comes to bloodshed and warfare, that is the uh, issue of conscription in the attempt to pursue victory against those enemies. But at the same time, if you're a genocidal regime, and as I show in the book, then you've got internal enemies within the social population groups that live within the boundaries of the state. And this is not the only way that genocide takes place. You can also have excursions to other countries where perpetrators are committing these crimes elsewhere beyond the borders. But often it is the case that uh, a genocidal regime is looking to implement policies to intentionally destroy a group that already exists within its boundaries. So let's take, for example, a genocidal regime in the abstract. It declares war or it is invaded or attacked by a foreign enemy. It is now in a state of war against that particular opponent. You then have the state either because it ordinarily conscripts, drafts, recruits, trains, and holds in reserve a capacity to hold a defensive line or go on an assault, uh, or alternatively, the implementation of a conscription policy that then brings in uh, reserves and drafts uh, men, often men, not only men, uh, for assaults against the enemy. That's, as we talked about, the kind of uh, fundamental acceptance of conscription for warfare. But if you're a genocidal regime, that provides what I call this guise, uh, a, an obfuscation of losses. So if you can uh, think of any of the modern warfares in which we have hundreds of thousands, often millions of casualties, well, that's a very unique opportunity for a genocidal regime to also expend the lives of a targeted population group, which it intentionally looks to kill and kill off in various ways. And that's this process I look at in the book, where we have conscription simultaneously to recruit fighters for war, but also to capture victims from a targeted population group that the state has already uh, initiated and intentionally looks to kill and kill off. And so the guise of war is this process by which these particular regimes that I look at have counted up the losses and just called them casualties, called them losses in warfare. But when you delve into the actual manipulations and the uses of conscription policy and the people who were targeted, the differences amongst uh, specific groups of conscripts taken from different population groups. There's an overlap between targeted victims of civilians who scholars accept are victims of genocide, and then the conscripts, often the young men, taken from those same communities. 
And so that's what my book addresses and examines. It's it's really interesting how they they find war as an opportunity to commit to to two things that they want to do to you know, commit to war, but also commit to their genocidal policies. And you know, you've, we've been alluding to a couple of these case studies that you've mentioned within your book, uh, and one of those is is the Ottoman Empire. So, how does the concept of genocidal conscription play out during World War One in the Ottoman Empire? So as historians and military historians know all too well, the sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire, uh, leading up to World War One, the outbreak in August of 1914, it's losing territories. It's losing uh, power, uh, economically speaking. Just think of the massive amounts of agricultural land and taxes that fall away as a result of this declining empire. It loses territories uh, aspects across north, northern Africa, also uh, southern eastern Europe as a result of the Balkan Wars, the losses in what today uh, is uh, southeast Europe, and those, uh, in many ways, the withdrawal, the retreat of the territory is something that's very, very significant in a range of cases. So while I look at specific cases and the histories, the microgranular analysis of those particular histories, I also uh, later on in the book go into, well, what are the patterns? What are the repeating similarities? Every case is unique. Every case needs to be respected and treated uh, with accurate language. At the same time, there are very significant similarities often. And we can talk about that later too. So the Ottoman Empire, is, it's in decline. And as a result, uh, the dominant power in society, Turkish ethno-nationalists, look to figure out a way in which it can maintain a nation-state that is for Turks in particular, Turkish population groups. Uh, what happens when the outbreak of warfare takes place, the Ottoman Empire isn't immediately in with the combat. It takes a few months for it to take stock and realize it's going to support and become an ally of Imperial Germany. And as a result, it's suddenly in conflict with Russia. And for the uh, kind of geographical layout, we're talking about the Anatolian Peninsula, today's Turkey, along with peripheral territories that were still uh, among uh, the land holdings of the Ottoman Empire at the time through to the eastern, uh, what's called the Caucasus Mountain region, and those border territories that are now Armenia, which is very significant for this case, also uh, the very southern border of uh, what would be Western Russia and its empire. So because uh, the Ottoman Empire is suddenly at war, and even before, even in the, the late summer months of 1914, the state, the empire begin, uh, began to uh, conscript laborers. And this was a, uh, a policy that had a long history uh, in terms of recruiting different population groups to build up the defensive capacity of the empire. You could go all the way back to the Janissaries, who were themselves uh, initially tribute conscripts drafted from southeastern European population groups and communities. And over time, that actually became quite an honorable group. And they ended up uh, serving as the immediate bodyguards of uh, the caliphs and the sultans of the Ottoman Empire. So conscription isn't always this terribly negative and uh, certainly not by any means always a genocidal outcome by any means, but it shows this, this uh, tendency to rely on uh, required service. So when you look at this issue of uh, the, the mixed ways that the Ottoman Empire used conscription to bring up different types of conscripts, tooled and trained to commit certain different activities and duties, that goes some ways to explaining what happened in this case I look at, genocidal conscription. By the uh, winter of 1914, Ottoman forces have uh, suffered pretty humiliating results on that Caucasus campaign to its eastern flank 
the, the southwest from Russia's perspective. And essentially, Russia was able to gain higher ground uh, in a, a mountainous set of battles, and it humiliated Ottoman leaders at the time. Uh, the result of that set of losses and those setbacks uh, culminated in what was a sporadic implementation of stripping particularly Armenian conscripts and also uh, s- volunteers who were already in the military forces leading into combat, uh, stripped them of rank and also arms and transition by relocation, many of these soldiers and conscripts into forced labor camps. And it was a punitive process that had precedent in the empire. This was a way that uh, Ottoman officials, but largely by 1914, Turkish Ottoman officials, uh, had imposed upon different minority populations. And there's evidence from the 1800s that Greek populations especially the younger men, but not only, is often the the working men of families who the state would uh, essentially make destitute by uh, capturing them, uh, arresting them, and then detaining them in these forced labor camps. So the same precedent was then also repeated, the same task of uh, punishing um, men, but also people in military institutions through this process by 1914. And then all of a sudden we have the emergence of what was called the Ten Commandments. And this was uh, specifically from the uh, Committee of Union and Progress. This is the CUP. This is the Turkish ethno-nationalist regime that has de facto taken over the empire uh, by this point. Uh, There was a revolution Uh, about five years previous to this, where the CUP claims power, and there's a somewhat kind of puppet-like figurehead sultan that isn't really the sultan anymore. Uh, uh, And so the CUP issues the Ten Commandments, and it takes place through December of 1914 through January of 1915. And in these particular commandments, we see... Uh, this very important issue of intent, right? So as we talked about this dispute between Lemkin's terminology and the United Nations terminology, the really difficult aspect is how do you show evidence of a perpetrator or suspect's intent to destroy a group? Well, in the Ten Commandments, these uh, orders distributed across the empire uh, in late 1914 and then going into 1915, we have very explicit orders that specifically talk to uh, and I'll quote here, uh, apply measures to exterminate all, ma- all males under 50, priests and teachers, leave girls and children to be al- is- Islamized. And so that's here the initial aspect of intent against the pati- particular population groups, men, specifically Armenians. And then also this other order that we have and in, in the Ten Commandments, you can look at that order number eight, to kill off in an appropriate manner all Armenians in the army, this to be left to the military to do. And so here's the red flag that says this is something that the state has uh, issued to the military and it's civil military relations in a genocidal regime. Now, because it's a policy, it takes a significant amount of time for this to become the acts, the outcomes, aspects of the five Uh, acts of genocide that the United Nations talks about, not just killing members of the group, but also other acts, including uh, imposing upon the targeted population conditions in which the subjects are no longer able to live. Also uh, intentionally imposing conditions to inflict harm on members of the group. And so these are three of the five outcomes, the acts and the crime of genocide uh, in this case that we can point to. And there's evidence to talk about that shows this to be, the, to be true. So the, United, uh, the, the Ottoman Empire moving into 1915 is also figuring out how it can defend its borders, right? You've got the uh, various forces, Gallipoli, 
you've got all sorts of tremendous amounts of losses on front lines to both uh, the eastern flanks and also the western flanks of the state. And at the same time, it's attempting to, for some, use conscription to punish uh, insubordination and what was actually something of a slur against the character of Armenian soldiers to say that they didn't give enough, they didn't fight hard enough. Uh, they, they essentially uh, capitulated to some extent on battle lines against Russian forces. But that's actually not true. It was this excuse to round up um, Armenian minority groups and also to capture, in particular, this is a crucial aspect, to capture the battle-aged males of these particular minority groups and then expend their lives, kill them off, and in some cases also directly kill in genocidal massacres uh, the victims of this case. So 1915 is where we see the orders uh, implemented, action uh, takes place across many different episodes of genocidal massacres. And then for me, I'm very interested in what happens in the labor camps? What happened to the forced laborers? And so this is where we get into the aspects of World War I as being the pivot point because it's uh, attrition in warfare, an ancient custom, an ancient aspect in the outcome of mass losses. Except with World War I, you've, you've got multiple mass armies, many of them utilizing conscription and the implementation of modern warfare technologies. And so the carnage is unprecedented. The losses are unprecedented. And for military historians, we can maybe talk about a little bit the, the idea of uh, Clausewitzian wastage. The accepted and expected mass losses become normalized in World War I. And this is where we see, uh, particularly the Ottoman Empire, taking advantage of this normalization, totally accept it. We're going to lose hundreds of thousands of people here. How about we also, at the same time, commit genocide against this particular population group? Because in the after war, the post-war environment, we want an ethno-nationalist state where those groups no longer exist. And it doesn't even matter how big the country is. We know we're going to uh, lose some territories in some aspect of a peace agreement or a treaty. It's a process. Uh, and so let's uh, expend those lines in uh, these wastage processes. So with World War One, Ottoman Empire, you see not just genocidal massacres, uh, literally Armenian conscripts taken, captured, sent uh, off into sites in which then Turkish commanders and other accomplices in the perpetration massacre the entire group of conscripts captured at that time. Uh, it happens over and over again, the reports show, and we, we've got even court documents to talk about uh, a dispute between administrators who wanted to use laborers for their labor to construct trenches, to build and maintain roads, to carry the logistic supplies uh, back and forth across frontline territories. And then also the perpetrators who were carrying out the genocide against Armenian forced laborers. And uh, so when we look at the, the way this happens in this case and then in others, it is conscripts who the state uses as forced laborers. And as a result, they are pushed to uh, literally the deadly consequences of hard labor without food adequate supplies of food, without adequate supplies of water or shelter or clothing. And this is this, this takes place with this case during the harsh winters and also the hot summers where injuries that the laborers sustain, the state does not provide any medical supplies or services. Injuries become infections, become uh, mortal wounds, and then also at the same time, you have a lot of evidence of beatings, of torture of the commanders that oversee and guard forced laborers, uh, cruelly punishing uh, the Armenian conscripts 
but also members of other communities, other uh, minority groups, uh, and then insisting that they go back to their work, even though they may have broken bones and other injuries, open wounds, bleeding. Uh, and so this is this process of wastage, the, the casualties of war. But when you look again under the surface of this obfuscation that the state has presented, it is actually a case of genocide at the same time as the same state uh, conducting war against an enemy. It's it's quite it's quite sad to see that that opportunity for conscription to to meet labour standards, but conscription to also commit genocide against a group that you de- declare as that internal enemy uh, occurring, but also being hidden as well under the as you say the guise of warfare. Now. World War One wasn't the only mass devastating conflict within the 20th century. Um, even though it was supposedly the war to end all wars, you end up having, or we end up having World War Two, not uh, not too long afterwards. And and in your book, you outline that there's another genocidal conscription regime, uh, and that is World War Two Axis era Hungary. So, how does this regime perpetuate genocidal conscription? Yeah, so the second case, um, and with comparative history, the aim is to talk about the similarities, the differences, the uniqueness of each case, also flesh out what might be the tendencies that repeat uh, to some extent, and maybe maybe clarify that as we know history rhymes rather than repeats. So the issues for the first case, uh, I think, are significant enough to talk about for historians of the Ottoman Empire. At the same time, though, we can see another substantial genocidal regime. And and in the scholarship of genocide studies, these are the two most prominent cases, mostly because it's the they are the cases for which we have the most evidence, the most sources, documents that still exist. And, and as we know, Nazi Germany, with its Axis allies, was very forthright in keeping a lot of records. And so the issue of genocidal conscription during the Holocaust is something I'd like to explore to some extent uh, with other cases as well. But when we look at uh, Axis era Hungary, uh, we we can go to some work from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's one of a number of collaborators. We've also got the Klinka Guard of Slovakia, the Iron Guard in Romania, the Ustasa in Croatia, and then what the case I look at is the Arrow Cross in Hungary. Arrow Cross is a fascist regime uh, that can, comes in towards the end of the war uh, once Germany has deemed that Hungary's politicians cannot run its uh, aims of genocide in its borders anymore, and it cannot also uh, effectively prosecute the war against the Soviet Union to its east. And this comes in at the end, towards the end of 1944. Previous to that, though, we also see Axis era Hungary enlisting, recruiting, mobilizing and conscripting forced laborers. And so this is a case I wanted to investigate as a result of this big gap, I would argue, in the history of Axis era Hungary pertaining to do with when did the Holocaust begin in that case? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's probably best put that the Holocaust is a set of multiple different genocides that overlap, often take place at the exact same time, across Axis occupied Europe. And so this is a case of genocide uh, against Jewish Hungarian labor service battalion members. These are the young men, Jewish young men in Hungary Uh, The state begins to uh, conscript particularly Jewish men for labor roles, along with other groups, similar to the the first case. Uh, Also, with alongside Jewish Hungarians, political dissidents, anyone that the state considered as perhaps undermining uh, the fascist uh, alliance with Germany. And so you have uh, a mixed bag of different types of forced labor recruits. Uh, And uh, as a result of uh, the targeting of Jewish populations, I focus more so on Jewish-Hungarian conscripts. So 
the to get into the, the history of that particular case, uh, again, we see um, something of a delayed alliance agreement for Hungary to join the Axis groups, uh, led primarily by Nazi Germany, Mussolini's Italy, and also Imperial Japan. Uh, but when Hungary does join, it is uh, immediately uh, on the hook as uh, a member of a uh, military alliance to supply troops for what had already taken place, the uh, Nazi German inv- and Axis allies invasion of Soviet Union territory as a result of Operation Barbarossa. And so you have uh, essentially as a result of supplying goods, providing intelligence, but not yet troops, this moment of preparation, specifically from the summer of 1941 on, where Axis era Hungary is looking at who is going to serve in which roles. Where can we get the bodies from? We know it's going to be another war of attrition that's already taking place. And so the state starts to uh, examine how it might be that it can provide soldiers, but also laborers, how it might be able to recruit from populations who have a history of supplying uh, men for military duties as volunteers, and also a massive amount, hundreds of thousands of conscripts. So as a result of, again, we see losses, a, a turnaround, an unexpected pushback, and loss of territory uh, through into in particular 1942 and through into 1943, we have uh, pressure placed upon leaders in Hungary to uh, provide more conscripts, more soldiers, more laborers uh, for Nazi Germany's effort uh, to defeat the Soviet Union. Now, in the history of Holocaust studies, a lot of the work has looked at what happened in 1944 as a result of Germany uh, coming in and taking over the specific institutions in Hungary to run the government, which didn't last long because it was very much so on the retreat and had to flee back uh, Austria, Austria-German territories uh, of the Reich uh, very soon afterwards. Um, however, what we see uh, in this case in particular, is something that takes place in a suburb in Berlin. Uh, And this is uh, in early 1942 with the Wannsee Conference. This is where, again, we see some intent, and there's more to say about Hungary in particular with its evidence to do with the intent to destroy Jewish Hungarians. But Vance and the, the documents from this conference, which were uh, recovered some years after the war itself, points to the widespread distrib- distribution of the intentional policies to destroy Jewish Europeans across the continent. And there's a caveat in that document that says, and Hungary, it's already, I'll, I'll paraphrase, it's already underway. It's already, they're already up to something. We're going to let them have some remit, some uh, semi-autonomous ways to, to take care of it themselves. Uh, and that was because of the political negotiations between Hungarian leaders and the Nazi regime, because they wanted to be an ally. They didn't necessarily want to become occupied, as other territories had by that point. Uh, so the issue of Vance is, uh, in particular, this culmination of recognizing the use of conscription, once again, to capture victims, to deploy them to the deadly environments of war, and then also hold to this obfuscation, this practice where you see the casualties, the mass casualties of warfare uh, as the institutionalized excuse for the mass losses. So in particular, I'm just going to quote a little bit here from uh, Vance, January 20th, 1942. Uh, and this is the translation into English. So as a way for perpetrators to carry out a part of the Holocaust, uh, the policy insisted 
that state institutions would do the following. And here's the quote. In pursuance of the final solution, the Jews will be conscripted for labor in the East under appropriate supervision. Large labor gangs will be formed from those fit for work with the sexes separated, which will be sent to these areas for road construction. And undoubtedly, a large number of them will drop out through natural wastage. And so the term wastage is one that we can look at uh, as prominent in military histories, certainly during World War II, but also World War I and before as well. It is something that uh, military Prussian strategist Karl von Clausewitz came up with in the early decades of the 1800s. He had witnessed Napoleon's Grand Army roll through Central Europe. Uh, he had also, in many ways, constructed uh, the idea of the patriot civil uh, civilian soldier as a way to bring in excited and uh, proud recruits from amongst the general population. But he was an advocate for conscription, as well as this two-tiered Prussian military process that he essentially established, uh, by which the commanders would be fully aware that some future battle would likely cause hundreds of thousands, if not more, casualties. And this is where he comes up with this term wastage. You've got to, as a commander, be aware of the wastage of your own forces and then the wastage of the opponent's forces. And to win in a war, you cause more wastage casualties than you incur. So as we see with Van Say, you know, fast forward to 1942, uh, you have this specific terminology used, but the the, the synonyms and the translation, it's, it's also useful to talk about that very briefly. It's about consumption, reduction, the uses of, the casualties of. Uh, and wastage was a, a term uh, in the German uh, application, Verbrauch. And um, what we see here with Vance is it's sometimes translated differently. It's sometimes thought of as uh, drop out through the reduction through natural causes or the reduction through uh, nat natural consequences. Uh, but the, the, the very fascinating uh, translation I use, uh, which comes from uh, a military historian's uh, interpretation of the term, specifically I'm using uh the, the words of scholars Jeremy Noakes and Jeffrey Pridham, uh, it is this phrase of natural wastage because it directly ties to the Clausewitzian training that everyone in command in the Nazi regime had gone through, that essentially all Western governments have used to train their militaries for what's now almost 200 years, uh, Clausewitzian wastage. Where are you going to get the bodies from? And so recognizing, again, that there's going to be massive number of losses, this is this obfuscation, this guise of warfare, to use the destructive processes of conflict to kill and kill off specific targeted members of the population. And so, as we know from the history of the Holocaust, this isn't simply just labor camps in the East. This is the concentration, concentration camp system. This is the conscription, relocation, and then destruction of conscripts of Jewish Europeans at large across the continent as well as in the case I look at, Axis era Hungary. We also have the massacres as well, genocidal massacres, groups of conscripts, uh, not just exposed to the deadly environments of forced labor without adequate supplies, actually supplies withdrawn and uh, the, the lack of access to medical services, also the torture the, that we saw that I, that I was able to uh, point out about case one, commanders and guards torturing, murdering, massacring larger groups of conscripts taken from the same targeted victim group as the general population in society, in this case, Jewish Hungarians. And already between you know, what you said about the Ottoman Empire case study and this Axis era Hungary, case study we're, we're beginning to see similarities and and maybe some slight differences so could you perhaps unpack some of these 
similarities in, and differences between the two examples? Well, let's look at the uh, similarities as, as we've talked about them already a little bit. I, I've mentioned them. I'll just kind of briefly summarize some of those aspects. This helped me, and I'll give the context of why they're important. This helped me provide uh, some something of a theoretical framework for how to identify potential concerning cases today and also in other historical contexts. So uh, if you have uh, a powerful group that's looking to entirely radically transform and uh, ref- um, change the outlook of the state, not just in its administrative institutions, but in its military, in its society and the groups that live within the state borders, you have... Uh, often this outcome in the cases of genocide that include the cases I look at. Uh, And what happens is the state then targets uh, some particular minority group. Interestingly, I found one case later on, more contemporarily, uh, that is a concern. I wouldn't conclusively say it's genocidal conscription, but it's actually the reverse, where there's a minority in power and a majority. uh, This is Syria, but uh, talk about that if you want to later. Um, But... With the two cases in particular, the similarities are uh, loss of territory, uh, a, a regime that looks to reform and through warfare expend the lives of battle-aged men, younger men, middle-aged men, often also teenage boys, who would perhaps, potentially, and in some cases do, when you look at uh, the uprisings in various parts of ox- occupied Europe in World War II, uh, resist and form defensive uh, holdings uh, in spite of the tremendous amounts of power that the genocidal regime uh, utilizes. So you, you've got this uh, targeting of a population group, the younger battle-aged men, and both states uh, first... Uh, use social divisions as a way to chastise, to scapegoat, to eventually isolate the population groups at large, the targeted potential victims, but also the battle-aged males of both uh, cases, both groups, Armenian, Ottomans, and Jewish Hungarians. Whether they're in the military or not, some were already prior to the outbreak of war in both cases. Some were then conscripted into the militaries. Uh, What happens uh, after the isolation of these particular targets is subordination. And this is the institutional process where guards, commanders, uh, police officers, gendarmes, auxiliary recruits from other minority groups, they are put in positions of power and authority by the state. They are empowered to take hold of, to capture, to detain uh, and relocate the specific targeted group of younger men from the targeted population communities. In both cases, there's a process during the subordination phase or step or stage where the state also then strips rank and arms. So you've got unarmed, unranked members of communities who are already facing uh, the perpetrators of a genocidal uh, policy at large in in society. It could well be that there are longstanding historical atrocities against such groups. That's actually a difference in the two cases. In the Ottoman Empire was the case. In Hungary, it was not the case. And Jewish conscripts, Jewish military, Jewish groups were actually heralded and uh, highly accepted, assimilated, integrated group of Jewish, uh, excuse me, of Hungarian society. Uh, what's called a golden age of Jewish European history in Hungary uh, in the decades prior to World War I. Uh, so because of service in World War I as well, a lot of Jewish Hungarian servicemen and conscripts and communities were honoured and held in high regard throughout Hungarian society. But, as I said, the similarity of subordination and the stripping of rank and arms, the weapons that the men hold, and weapons that are held within the community in private households, that's a step that happens in both cases. So that similarity then also extends 
to relocation, where the young men are held in subordinated roles during the conscription process, and then they're relocated, the state relocates the perpetrators, often themselves conscripts as well, from other communities, other groups, they relocate their victims, and then we see this last stage of destruction. Destruction can take place and does take place in these two cases in two ways, both, again, similar in a kind of abstract theoretical concept, but uh, the findings show it happened in both cases in both ways. The first being through the wastage of war, but because of the intent to destroy the group, it becomes this concept of what I call genocide by wastage, where you have uh, the men and young boys subjected to the deadly environments of war, often through these roles of forced labor. Uh, highly uh, damaging, physically damaging and harmful roles and duties that incur death at a large scale, at a widespread scale, uh, with thousands of casualties. And that's how the state reports the losses. But because of this intent to kill off members of that group, we're actually talking about genocide instead of warfare casualties. Then in the second uh, outcome of destruction, there's evidence that shows genocidal massacres took place in both cases against other conscripts taken from the same groups. And because of that evidence, the uh, suggestion that there was some other intent, I would say is uh, moot, if not even perhaps uh, an aspect of denying genocide took place against these particular victims. Because how could your own commanders or commanders from an ally with the oversight from your own military commit massacres against conscripts belonging to your own military forces. It doesn't make sense in other uh, any other circumstance. And it's certainly not the case that they were casualties of warfare, but rather they are, and I would count them as victims of genocide. So those are uh, most of the similarities. The differences, as I said, is um, aspects in, in how the state viewed members of the certain groups over time and in certain places. Uh, in the first case, Armenian Ottomans had been uh, harangued, harassed, massacred, abused, uh, killed off and killed in various uh, historical events from the past. So the Hamidian massacres of the 1890s is a big one that shows this was a group at risk previous to the specific case of genocide during World War I. Whereas in the second case, Jewish Hungarians, as I've said, uh, very much a, a heralded and honored community within Jew uh, Hungarian society uh, for the reasons I've already stated. Uh, other differences that I think are, are worth talking about is the ways in which you have, in the first case, a state that is looking to centralize, reform, and and be okay with even a reduction of the territories it's holding as long as it is able to establish an ethno-nationalist state with and through not just warfare, but also genocide. In the second case, uh, Axis era Hungary was caught in the midst of this great battle between two massive totalitarian regimes, Soviet Union, Nazi Germany. And as a result, it had hoped to, and its leaders had hoped to appease and go along with Nazi Germany as much as it needed some support to create that win and that victory in the East for Lebensraum, the living space for which it could then increase its borders through warfare, but at the same time also uh, collaborate and participate in the extermination of Jewish targets as a part of the Holocaust. So that is something of a difference uh, in, in the ways the states and the politics of the regimes worked. And because of the mixed feelings that some leaders had towards Jewish communities, you also see, even at the unit level, the unit level command of particular groups of forced laborers, some of which towards the end of the war included women and children, members of the Magyar, the Hungarian uh, demographic that were uh, running the state and the military at the time, uh, they actually figured out that it might not be such a good idea to perpetrate these orders. 
that the state had issued, not just to Vance through the Nazi regime, but also what's called the uh, attache case order. And this is, a, a again, the, the sh- this shows not just the intent to destroy group, the group, but also the uh, utility of obfuscation through uh, reporting losses as casualties of war, because um, military commanders were told to bring the conscripts, Jewish Hungarian conscripts, back in an attache case. You're not bringing bodies back. What you're bringing is the list of the losses, the names of the people killed off as a result of the war. But if you're already going into the conflict, preparing, don't bring any bodies back, don't bring any people back, don't bring any Jews back, just bring back their names in the reports. Well, you can see what that means in terms of go and make sure that they die and die off, however you see fit in these wartime activities. Uh, So because of um, that intent, we do have the evidence to say that Axis era Hungary itself perpetrated genocide against Jewish Hungarians, rather than simply just saying, well, they were bystanders, they were caught in the middle, there were members of the regime that committed it, and then also further collaborated in the mass deportations in 1944, where essentially almost everyone else in uh, Jewish Hungarian population groups within the state, they uh, were, the, were the victims of uh, the state officials of the Arrow Cross fascist regime and Nazi collaborators who were occupying Hungary by that time. All of those civilians, uh, approximately 400,000 men, women, and children were then relocated and killed in the concentration camp system. It's it's interesting to see the the amount of overlaps between the two case studies uh, and to see you know as you said history rhymes and and to see those similar traits being picked up across these two case studies now you, you mentioned something that i do very quickly want to unpack uh which is that it's still possibly occurring today in the 21st century could we quickly unpack that that, that statement there because i think that was quite that's quite an interesting point there for listeners to to learn and be able to recognize these traits and and know where these traits are emerging in today's world. Yeah, it it is something that took me about a year after I completed my dissertation, which was the the kind of uh, seed of the book. And what I ended up doing was having to survey conscription policies across the world today. And by today, I think it was uh, 2021 and 2022. And so um, as a scholar of military history, with my focus on uh, the potential human rights abuses that take place in states that utilize conscription in less orthodox or traditional ways. Uh, A big one that came up in the years of study, I looked at it for going on 12 years now, uh, is Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Russia's annexation of Crimea earlier on. And so because of that, I questioned whether to look at the Soviet Union as a case, as a third case in the book. Um, And I came to the conclusion throughout the dissertation graduate years that there are useful uh, third case differences that would provide some insights. However, it is one that even today, even now, years into Russia's aggression against Ukraine, we have something of a debate even now in terms of the Soviet Union's carrying out of genocide in what's known as the Holodomor, the forced uh, famine of Ukrainian civilians uh, during Stalin's reign over the Soviet Union. And so the, the for me, I do. I, I, I accept that the evidence points enough towards uh, a case of genocide and it would be interesting to see if there's, there has been more evidence that more definitively provides for that argument, though it was too far away from the variables and the aspects that I was looking at and that evidence pointed to. So I talk about Russia, I talk about Soviet Union, certainly, and its use of various types of conscripts historically. And then in this last part of the book, I also look at Russia in contemporary concerns. So when it look when when we talk about implications today, those similarities that I pointed out, uh, how it is that you have 
social groups that have an asymmetrical power relationship, right? Minorities, majorities. Um, you've also got some losses of territory. So you've got a state that's already on edge, already in a state of crisis and an emergency with its defense of its boundaries. Um, you, you have uh, political disputes with long-standing conflict amongst different population groups. And as a result of those factors, those variables, right, who's in power, who's disempowered, what are the conflict issues, then you go and look at and analyze who's implementing conscription today in its various forms in authoritarian regimes, right, those that inflict uh, severe policies to maintain power, those that restrict civil liberties, those that prohibit political rights, those that preference the majority group that's in power, and those that disenfranchise and discriminate against minority groups. Well, you've got a whole long list, and, and I come up with this in the book in terms of the survey of conscription in use today. Um, but very briefly, let me let me run through types of conscription, right? We've got, uh, I want to say, 10 different forms of conscription that work, because often people just think, oh, it's, it's recruitment and then deployment in combat, right? That's what it means. But Russia's actually using uh, a variety of different processes for conscription today. It's got combat, yes. Uh, it has men only. It has reserve. And it has training. So these are all conscription policies with designated and classified outcomes. It's goals. Right? What does it want its conscripts to do? Um, you've also got alternative forms, which are often tied to uh, training programs. So think of the officers who have to serve, right? Civilians that have to serve, but they're in the officer class of the society, and they provided the training uh, programs to go into management or politics or government uh, in various ways. So you've got alternative combat. There's also child recruitment, right? Conscription of children. Uh, it's more informal rather than a formal government policy. You've got for labor. So think of North Korea or the Uyghur case for China today. Men only is a very significant aspect when we look at issues of gender. We can talk about ballage men. That's uh, something I've mentioned that's a term coined by Adam Jones, who's another scholar of genocide and gender side, uh, the intentional destruction of a group based on sex policies. Uh, then you've got men and women. So these are countries that are authoritarian and also conscript both men and women. And sometimes there's a variation in that, right? So the men are often uh, trained for infantry, where women, it's often that it's about the auxiliary and the logistical support that uh, women are then trained in for supporting the state. Very often to actually identify potential political leaders, and we see that with, uh, I would argue, the case of China, right? China's conscription of women largely is because of its political uh, needs to recruit and employ, you know, 50 plus one or however you want to put it, percent of the population in its Chinese Communist Party regime, right? So you, you need a, the numbers and the bodies to observe the population and monitor and maybe inform or, or adjust uh, the social habits of the population. As I said, also reserve and training. So reserve capacity, they're, they're trained, they're ready, but they're maybe working in their full-time jobs. But at a moment's notice, they could well be deployed. Training, as I said, that's uh, the, a good example of that is actually the Swiss government's use of conscription. So it isn't to say that the Swiss, as we know, they're not that well known for going off into warfare, that they're more neutral, but for home defense, training. Uh, and still today, if you're going to be a citizen of Switzerland, then you need to put enough time aside to go into government pro programs of self-defense training and also national defense. Uh, the use of uh, small arms, most often rifles and pistols. And then the last uh, type I, I was able to um, categorize is unofficial in mil militias. So this is a form of conscription that takes place. It's similar to child recruitment. Uh, it's often young men, teenage boys, who through international law classifications are not considered as children, but 
uh, you know, a, a set, a several sets of pickup trucks during a civil war, men in pickup trucks come along maybe to some kind of social gathering, could be a football game that's pretty often in Africa. Uh, and on the spot, everyone is enlisted, right, quote unquote, drafted, conscripted, but there's no paperwork involved. There's no official regimes policy, um, but they're now, you know, a member of that uh, warring party in the ongoing conflict. So implications for today, uh, with all that said, drew, drew me towards eight states of most concern. So I'll list them briefly. Afghanistan. Uh, in particular, you want to look out for uh, Hazaras as a potential group that uh, members of the regime in Afghanistan may well conscript in a process to carry out genocide against that group. In China, uh, questions about the Uyghur population are pretty pom- prominent, have been for several years. Lots of governments and also United Nations have made declarations about that particular case. Eritrea uh, is a country in East Africa. Uh, and we've got um, Tigray and also Saho, uh, disempowered groups there. In Ethiopia, uh, country next door in, to Eritrea, you have uh, the Amhara, and there's a fair amount of uh, information about Somali and also Tigrayan. And this is a case that's pretty prominent today as well in genocide studies, the uh, potential genocide of Tigrayans in Ethiopia. And that gets back to wastage uh, during war, the, the, the casualties of war. But they're in the civilian population. And the Tigrayan case is really fascinating for me because it's it's not that the members of civilians are necessarily conscripted per se. I would be very surprised if that's not happening. I'm yet to, to go and study and find the evidence for it. But uh, the the aspect of a forced famine, the, the isolation of huge swathes of populations, who are cut off from international aid, who have their crops burnt and destroyed, who have the roads and the bridges destroyed, specifically to compel the civilian population to give up its cause and uh, hand over the belligerents, the combatants, the young battle-aged men who are attempting to resist uh, the Ethiopian government in that particular case. Russia, as I've mentioned, uh, very much significant findings that are emerging in terms of Tatar, Ukrainians, specifically in Crimea. And we've got a number of international organizations, human rights organizations, and the UN is beginning to delve into the situation in Ukraine uh, and other populations as well. Uh, And so what what we're talking about there is because of Russia's invasion of the territories of Ukraine, and you talk about the uh, annexation 2014 of Crimea, minority groups, including Tatar, uh, Crimean Tatars, it's a Muslim population group, uh, an outsider group. And this is something I, I wanted to just draw your listeners to a little bit is the, the work of Irvin Staub and the idea of in groups and out groups. That's a really quick and, and uh, definitive way to point out who has power and who's on the periphery or who's totally pushed to the outside and are deemed expendable, unwanted population groups. And that last part is a concept brought um, uh, into scholars' uh, views from uh, Richard L. Rubenstein. Uh, and he's passed on now, but his, his concept of unwanted population groups as being the target of genocidal regimes. So it's ongoing. Efforts are uh, afoot to uh, gather the evidence and perhaps even push for prosecution, at least charges of potential perpetrators of a genocide ongoing in Ukraine. Uh, And then I'll I'll just run through the last three cases of concern. South Sudan, a newer country, uh, split off as a result of a civil war in what was a larger Sudan uh, several years ago. And in South Sudan, we have um, two different groups of particular concern, the Nua and the Shiluk. And then in Sudan itself, we also have a number of different minority groups. I think of Darfur. It's a big example. Uh, it's been going on for at least 20 years already as a case of genocide in Sudan. 
Um, we've got uh, minority groups of uh, Fur, Beja, Nuba, uh, and Nubian. Uh, because of the political conflict in that territory, it's still ongoing, still raging. Again, I would not be surprised to see forced conscription into labor roles that incur mass losses of at least one of those disempowered groups. And then in Syria, as I said, and this is something of an exception because the minority Shia Alawi group are in power and it is the Sunni Arab majority population that's often targeted and uh, placed into these uh, intentionally destructive roles of conscription, as well as Sunni Kurd, Christian Greek and Christian Armenian population groups. It's it's very interesting that a lot of these regimes are, as you've said, they're regimes that we've had attention drawn to in the past. Uh, but they're also regimes where some of them are where, where there's been conflict occurring uh, or in terms of more political conflicts with broader enemies, uh, you know, with Demer- China and America entering political conflict and so on. But we've had a very dark conversation i don't think you cannot have a dark conversation if you talk about genocide so i want to kind of shift the tone for our final fun question as we do here for everyone on the history jackson podcast uh and my final fun question is for you you know you you lived and worked across both the us and the uk what do you think is the biggest difference in life between the two yeah great question i love the idea of uh looking at this in terms of how I myself have experienced the different societies, but then also what the differences between the societies themselves are. So for myself, um, the big one is property, right? So I'm, uh, it, it is something of a, a, a funny way when I teach to, uh, to my students here in the US, I they'll often let me teach American politics, which I think is kind of funny. And the students kind of find it funny because I'm an immigrant. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I got some insight in terms of getting to America. Uh, But when they hear me speak, they go into the tropes of how Americans view British people. And, you know, so it is, uh, you know, lots of discussions about Harry Potter and tea and uh, football. And yes, I, I actually have given up on correcting soccer. I say soccer a lot. Um, but the code switching, this is what I call code switching. It's something in linguistics where it depends on who you're talking to. You're going to change how you speak. And funnily enough, I think my uh, wife, when she hears the, the podcast here, she's going to be like, oh, you, you spoke British again, didn't you? Right. And I'll start dropping my T's and all of that. Right. Um, and, and it does come out very, very uh, clearly when I'm talking to someone else who is from the British Isles. I did it there, British. Um, and, and I also have two, two sons and they, their accents are fantastic because they, they're able to code switch and lay it on thick with, uh, the mostly kind of South London accent is kind of where, uh, one string of my family's from, uh, Tulls Hill. Uh, and so they, uh, they can put it on too. And my students join in a little bit now and again. Uh, but I, I haven't quite got like my, my I guess I, I'm some, I end up doing a, a mix of a Texas and Midwest accent when I put it on for them. And it's just like this horrible twang that I, I throw in now and again, not very convincing at all. And, and so the funny, the funniest thing that the, the most fun thing I would say is for me, just seeing how people react in different ways when you bring up the cultural reference points. And uh, I would say I'm fairly Americanized now. So my, my take in, on it is, uh, you know, South London, if you know anything about the British Empire, lots of people end up in Australia because and I'm often mixed up with an, having an Australian accent being from Australia because uh, that's how colonization happened, right? Masses of people shipped off to the other side of the world rather than have them in the workhouses or the poor houses or the prisons. So I, I, my family on that side, I, I explain it as being the pauper class. Uh, we generally don't have cars. We don't have houses. We don't have stable careers. I wanted to not follow in those footsteps as best I could. And I definitely didn't want to put it on my kids for, for having them live in England. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's one level below the working class, right? Um, 
something of the outgroup, I'd argue. And maybe that's, you know, something to do with the way the British caste system works or not, because I don't live there anymore. So I, I can't necessarily give or much, much of a comment on that. Uh, but out here it's property, right? You can make not just ends meet, but, you know, you pay your dues, you, you do some time, you, you put in the shifts and it's a little bit more stable. It's not to say it's, it's ideal or, you know, it's always going to work out well, but it, it, growing up in the Cold War, right? So I was born in the 80s. I saw the huge shifts, right? As, as to how it was that not only were the dilapidated, old, decrepit uh, hangovers from the empire, right? Where the factories were derelict and it's broken down, and, you know, those towns. Um, but also once the markets opened up on the continent of Europe because of the end of the, of the Cold War, investment went elsewhere. So, you know, businesses shut down, as you might recall, in the 90s, very quickly overnight, the credit crunch, um, I forget what, Black Monday or Tuesday, whichever day of the week it was, where John Major was the prime minister. Uh, and so here, the, it, it was tough during 2007 and 2008, for sure, of course. But even then, and as a result of COVID, shut down again and, and, and serious uh, disruption in the economy. The way it bounces back, there's still this social mobility. Uh, people can still get greater access to higher education and careers, I'd argue, um, and I certainly lived through it, um, than in most, not, not everyone's experiences, but obviously, you know, the, the majority of people in the UK. Um, so I would ask that, that maybe we, we could, yeah, readdress some of those more static barriers to social mobility. I know there's been a, a tremendous effort in the last decade or so to at least acknowledge them. I don't necessarily think that we've, we've gotten that far to really do much about it based on what I'm hearing from my family back in England and, and Scotland is where they live nowadays, um, where, you know, still no car, right? Petrol is ridiculously expensive. The ability to go 10 miles in your own car and the insurance and, you know, the, the amount of cost it gets to get licensed and, and get your, uh, you know, your tag in the UK, I did the math once. It was something like when I was, when I was in my twenties, it was something like 2000 pounds to go about all of the steps to get the cheapest secondhand car and the license and the training and the lessons. Cause you had to have so many hours of required lessons and all that in the U S $10. And it was the processing fee to take the test and get your license. So it's that kind of thing in terms of how property works um, that is really the biggest difference for the actual countries themselves um, and, and goes a, a fair amount of way in terms of uh, why it is that we do see so many British people not in Britain. I, I, I love that answer. As someone who lived in the US uh, at some point in life, I, I definitely read like the code switching point definitely resonates with me. Um, with me occasionally slipping into some Americanisms when I do speak to, to people from that side of the world. So yeah, I think that's a great answer. Now, of course, people are going to want to go away, grab a copy of your book and find you and interact with you online. So where can people find you and grab a copy of your book, Chris? Wonderful. Yeah, thanks. So I'm on LinkedIn primarily uh, in my professional capacity so you could just look up christopher harrison phd and you'll see me there i'm also on uh, what's now x formerly twitter and so my handle is no more wastage on that then when it comes to the book it's it's available in all good bookstores as they say however i would like to just uh, inform your listeners about a fantastic promotional discount code that the publisher has put on so this is Roman and Little Field. So if you go to roman.com, that's O, uh, excuse me, R-O-W-A-A-M-A-N.com, roman.com. Uh, you can find my book, just type in genocidal conscription. And then for a 30% discount for both the hardback and the ebook editions, you can use the promotional code uh, L-X-F-A-N-D. F three zero, and uh, that way you can get a hold of the book with a, a nice little 
discount for anyone interested in the work. Well, I'll make sure that that discount code and that link is in the description below so people can get a copy of it and have that discount code readily available. But thank you very much for coming on, Chris. I really appreciate it.